All right, so here we go. Uh, this is one of the reasons I decided that we need to walk through this sermon series this summer. Uh, we're going through a book called Disciplines of a Godly Man. There's another book called Disciplines of a Godly Woman. And uh, depending on your gender, you're reading one of the two books. Uh, but one of the reasons that we're going through this series is today's sermon. I read it. I thought this is super, super applicable uh, to, to what I feel like new life is all about and how change happens. And this whole 22, 22 is about change. It's about spiritual change in your life that if you're not a Christian, you become a Christian. And if you already are a Christian, then you grow in your faith because nothing changes if nothing changes. We have to make needed changes in our life to grow up in our faith, to get off the bottle, to quit drinking milk, and to be Christians that are loving and serving Christ in a community that's lost. And so we want to be a change agent in Aberdeen. We want to be a change agent in Peru. We want to be a change agent in Bullhead. We, we want to be a people that look different. And so we've been preaching through the disciplines spiritually of what the Bible lays out for us, and we've covered some things like the discipline of marriage and the uh, discipline of, of parenting, and we're going to hit that topic again on Father's Day in a few weeks, but we've been looking at these different disciplines but I want to present to you this reality today as we get started, that really this could have been the first sermon. It really does start with this idea of the discipline of the mind, and the reason this is important is it's completely undiscussed in church. And so what I would ask from you today as we get started is that you would take some notes. The other thing that I want to present to you today is that secularism has hijacked this principle in a major way in therapy circles all around the world. The most popular and the most researched therapeutic theory on change is called cognitive behavioral therapy. And I don't, may, have you heard of that? Does anyone have a background? Have you heard of cognitive behavioral therapy? Okay, so let me just give you the basic premise. I wasn't even going to go there, and then I started talking about it this morning. I thought I'm going to get this as a starting point. Cognitive behavioral therapy, I even wrote it on an official document so I remember to say it. Okay, cognitive, I'm like, I'll forget to say that if I don't do that. Cognitive behavioral therapy has been hijacked in secular circles and therapeutic circles uh, by Christianity, by Jesus Christ himself, and specifically by this guy named the Apostle Paul that we're going to read about today and what he says about having the mind of Christ. And the basic premise is this, if you like things like this, write it down real quickly. It's going to take about a minute. The basic premise is it all starts with your thoughts. And so in our emotive state, we think that we feel and then we act, and that feelings drive everything. But what's been researched and proven to be true is that before you ever feel, you think. And so the cycle goes like this. You think, you feel, you act. You think, you feel, you act. And so then the therapeutic strategy is to disrupt the thinking pattern, to change it, and to interject thoughts that are healthy for your mental health, and then when you do that, the train gets rolling and the cycle gets disrupted, and so when you think differently, you feel differently, you act differently, and round and round and round and round it goes, and what's so crazy about that is that's completely hijacked from Jesus Christ himself. That what's already been researched and proven to be true long before research existed has already been proven to be true by our Lord and Savior. And so I want to present that to you today in this idea of discipline of the mind. We're going to be looking at Philippians. You can turn your Bibles there. You can see on the screens. You can look on your phones. Uh, but as we're in Philippians, just a little bit of background on Paul. Paul plants a church in a city called Philippi. It's a healthy, vibrant church. He's writing now from Rome in a prison about 800 miles away. He wants to let his friends and his church family know how he's doing. And his circumstance is such, he's been falsely accused, he's been wrongly imprisoned, his reputation has been trashed, he's now awaiting trial, which could possibly lead to death, and we know that he ultimately did die for his faith. And so as he's pinning this letter to a church that he loves dearly, he's doing so in physical chains. He would have been chained to a, a jailer in Rome. And here's what we need to hear this morning, Paul's joy because he has this tremendous joy. Philippians is my favorite epistle. He has this tremendous joy in the Lord, not in his circumstance. And write this down. Paul has joy despite his circumstance. 
And so what he does is he wraps up this short epistle, this letter to the church to let him know how he's doing, and he's focusing on this reality that we're to love the Lord God with all our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. But what he's focusing on at the end of this letter and this, that, that those four key things of how we have joy, he's focusing on the mind. And his whole theology, Paul's theology, is built around this whole idea of being not conformed to the world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's this spiritual discipline of the mind, and he starts it off by telling us exactly how to be spiritually healthy and how to be mentally healthy for the Lord. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians 4.8. He, he, he just completely hands it to us on a platter. He's writing to the church. He's talking about this secret ingredient to living for Christ, and he gets very specific. He says, verse eight, chapter four, Philippians, he says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, he says, if there's anything excellent, If there is anything worthy of praise, here's how he finishes it, verse eight. This this sounds so incredibly simple, but I promise you, just stay the course with me today. This is life-changing stuff. He makes all of these statements that we're gonna break down. He says, whatever is worthy of praise, and here's the brilliant advice. He says, think about these things. I'm in a prison cell, and my life is incredibly complicated. Emotionally, I have the choice to be all over the place. I've done nothing wrong but preach the gospel since I've been saved, and I'm now being persecuted. When I was murdering people, I was being praised. And now that I'm doing the right thing with the right motive to the right Savior, now my life physically is a mess, but my Health, spiritually, has never been stronger because I'm thinking about all of these things, whatever is true, whatever is just, whatever is pure. Can you imagine focusing on what's just in the middle of that type of injustice? Whatever is this, whatever is that, think about these things. And so regarding spiritual disciplines, write this down, fill it in your blank, Discipline starts, just like cognitive behavioral therapy has already researched, discipline starts in the mind. It starts in the mind. Write this down, change. If you want to see change in your life that's godly, change starts in the mind. That's what Paul's saying. Mental health starts with thinking God's thoughts. Now here's the secularist, humanistic perspective. Mental health starts with thinking God's happy thoughts or thinking positive thoughts or thinking thoughts about how great you can be if you just believe in yourself. Now, the gospel inverts that and says you're a sinner in need of saving, but now mental health starts from this place of recognizing who Jesus Christ is in your life and then taking on the literal mind of Christ through these different avenues that Paul just laid out for us. Discipline starts in the mind. Mental health starts with thinking God's thoughts. Here's a way of explaining it through analogies and through metaphors. It's kind of like physical health in the sense that your physical health is largely dependent, and this is sad to admit because this is not a strength of mine, your physical health is largely dependent on what food you put in your body, true? I mean, we can make like 100 excuses, right? But our physical health is largely dependent on what type of food we put in our body. I had a guy tell me that was at the YMCA that's in really good shape. He said, I have never been out, he's lifting weights. He goes, I've never been able to outlift my fork. And I thought, well, there's the problem. That's why I struggle. I like exercise. I like food more, right? So your physical health is largely dependent on what food you put in your body. Your mental health, write it down, is largely dependent on what thoughts you allow to reside in your mind. You cannot have physical health without changing your diet. You cannot have mental health without changing the focus of your thoughts. And so the whole objective is to get your mind right, to take on the mind of Christ like Paul's talking about, and then let that trickle down 
and to different areas of your life. If your mind isn't right, the bottom line is you're going to be miserable. If your perspective isn't right, if you're not looking through the lens of the mind of Christ, even these good things, you're going to miss these blessings. And I'm just going to be very straightforward with you. There have been times from the pulpit that I've been incredibly hypocritical where I've said to myself, like, I've had this week, and it's gone a certain way, and I've got to the pulpit, and I've said, you should all live like this, and I'm kind of cringing while I'm talking because I'm going, I don't think I added up this week to what I just told the congregation to do, the church called New Life to do. There has never been a more hypocritical sermon than the one you're about to hear today. I struggle with this. The whole discipline of the mind, it's like, for me, you know, one day goes great, and the other day my mind is, is weak, and, and I'm worrying, and I'm anxious, and I've talked about that. I've been pretty transparent about that. This is a struggle for me, but the blessing of that is I feel like I have a vantage point where I get it in a different level, right? Because these ideas like anxiety and depression and, and worry, these are things that can, at different points in my own life, they can plague me as a pastor, even as a therapist. But your mental health is largely contingent on getting your mind right, and even good things, if you don't have the right mind of Christ, can be bad things. Paul says, get transformed by the renewing of your mind, and what he's really saying in this text is fix your focus. Focus on, number one, write it down, you'll see it on the screen, focus on, this is how you change and renew your mind, focus on what is true. How do you define truth? Truth is that which corresponds with reality. Truth isn't contention on what you think is true. There are some things that the laws of nature tell us are true. I remember a few years ago, I was feeling good, and I was feeling like I was getting in shape, and I made this statement that some people never forgot. I said, within six months, I'm going to dunk a volleyball. Does anyone remember that? It was a few years ago. I thought I could, yep, yeah, yep, all right, judger. I thought I could do it, and then it turns out, that wasn't within the laws of nature. I think I got to a golf ball, maybe, on the tips of my fingers, and then I quit. I couldn't do it. Right? Because we can talk about truth all day long, but truth has to correspond with reality. I can say that I can do these things, but it has to actually line up with the laws of nature. And unfortunately, with my genetics and age and whatever, that wasn't within the laws of nature, and so that never happened. And we live in a world right now where truth has been absolutely hijacked, where, where facts are hard to find, and the agendas have taken over. And what, no matter what you say is true, can you relate to this? Look at me when I tell you this. No matter what you even think to be true, there will be somebody on the internet that will have a reason that your truth is not real. And things that 20 years ago we would have thought, we would never disagree on. All of a sudden now, truth has been hijacked in such an intense way where it's almost like it's like your head is spinning because you're going, well, at least I thought we could all agree on this, or at least we thought, you know, like things related to our biology and our makeup and, and just being male and being female, things that 20 years ago we thought, well, we'll never disagree on this. You relate? Now all of a sudden we're looking around, even in South Dakota, and we're going, I guess people don't all believe that. But truth has to, has to align with reality. And so focusing on that truth is the juggernaut to this spiritual health that we're talking about today. When the mind goes crazy, write this down. When the mind goes crazy, if you're wondering why, you know, some days I'm doing well, some days I'm really struggling. When the mind goes crazy, here is a common denominator. Lies are being believed. And if we ever want to grow up in our faith and get off the milk and get off the bottle, we have to choose to believe truth and combat lies with that truth. And there, there's all sorts of lies that are rumbling around in our head, that we're in control, that God is powerless over our circumstance, that death is the end, that people and money are to be worshipped, that I must be perfect, that I must not fail, that I must be God. I mean, on and on the list goes, and it wreaks havoc on the spiritual discipline of the mind. And so here's what we try to do. When life goes crazy, maybe you can't relate to this, but I bet you can, so stay with this. This is the remedy in our mind, that we live our life and we let all of these things that are lies infiltrate our minds because we don't put on the mind of Christ. And there's a reason 
that Paul brings this up first when he talks about the spiritual discipline of the mind. He brings this up first, this idea of focusing on what is true because this is the juggernaut to the whole thing. If you believe lies, you will not walk in truth and it will wreak havoc on your emotions. But maybe this is you. I bet it's true for about 80% of us. Your life goes crazy. Your mind goes crazy. You thought you had something under control that you realize you don't have under control. And when your mind goes crazy and your emotions go crazy, then what do you do? What do you do? All right, then you say, God, please help me fix this problem. It'll never be this way again. I need your help. I need your help. I need your help. Here's what spiritually disciplined people do that's the exact opposite of how we operate. They walk in this truth, and so they're already walking in the truth, and when things start to get a little crazy or hectic in the mind, they lean back in on the truth because they already had it predetermined before the crisis ever hit. And so what I've done historically is I thought I can kind of just lean in on whatever I feel like I can lean in on, and then when life gets a little hectic, I go back to God and I say, God, help me, God, help me, God, help me, and then when God helps me, I go right back to the crisis cycle that got me there in the first place. What spiritually disciplined people do is they find the truth, they meditate on the truth, they go through a mini crisis or even a crisis, and they already have the truth that's grounded them, and they're meditating on it, and so they have this vantage point in their life of pre-established truth that they lean in on that helps subside emotional crisis cycles in their mind. Jesus says this. He says, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you what? Free, that there's freedom in walking in this truth. He prays this high priestly prayer to the Father in John 17. He says, sanctify them by the truth. He says, your word, God, is the truth. And the reality is this. If you're going, well, what's true and what's not true, because there's all this stuff floating around, it's very simple. It's very simple. God's word that we're reading today through the book of Philippians and all 66 books are ordained by God. God's word is truth and you will never have truth. Look at me. You will never have truth in your life apart from the word of God. You will always be leaning in one direction or another. You'll be like a ship that's lost at sea. If you don't have the word of God grounding you, you will never be grounded in reality. You will never be grounded in truth. The gospel is truth. Jesus Christ is God, born of a virgin, lived with no sin, died on a cross for your sins, three days later rose from the grave so that you can be born again. And now he's at the right hand of the Father. He's gonna judge your sin. You're gonna stand before him. This is all truth. You are going to go to heaven or you're gonna go to hell, not contingent on your own works, but contingent on the fact that you've leaned in on him and surrendered your life entirely to him. That's the truth. That's the unchanging, unwavering truth that is gonna anchor you in the good times and in the bad times, that is gonna grow you in your faith when you lean in on that reality. Jesus Christ is truth. He says, focus in on it. When I look on the peripheral, my life is a mess. But I've got joy and I've got peace and I've got contentment because I hone in on the truth. He says this, he says, focus on what's honorable. To fix your focus and to look up to the mind of Christ and those things that bring honor to God and focus on those things. Submit your life to those things. Follow the pattern and the character of Jesus Christ. We have spent so much time celebrating what we should be grieving in our culture around us that we've lost this idea of focusing on what's honorable to God. He says, focus on what's just. God himself is just. God himself is what justice looks like. And so focus in on the nature of God and his justice. Here's a big one. Here's one that derails so many. He says, focus on what is pure. Take on the mind of Christ if you want the peace of Christ. Focus on what's pure. And here's how defining purity is in the Bible. It's innocent or clean instead of dirty or defiled. And the connotation, the context of this verse, of this verbiage, of this Greek word is through the lens of sexual purity. And so all of those things on the peripheral that have never been even ever in the history of the world, that we've never had access to like we have them now, take them, don't allow them in your life, put them over here, and then fix your focus onto what is pure. 
Because purity defined in this verse is the love that God gives a man and a woman for each other in the context of marriage. And if you're focused on sexuality outside of that, then you will not be focused on what is pure. There, there are certain things, we've talked about this before, there are certain things that have different types of power in your life to really wreak havoc on how you live out the gospel. And when it comes to purity, there, there, this probably takes the cake. I've said to you before, sin is equal in damnation. If you never heard it, write it down. Sequel, sin is equal in damnation, but not in what? Do you remember? But not in devastation. That there are certain things that just have more consequence even if they're all equally damning. They're not all equally devastating. Adultery has a different immediate consequence than jaywalking. There are certain things that just really wreak havoc on the mind and that play out in the life of a Christian. And this idea of purity, which really is front and center of the world that we're living in, is wreaking havoc not only on ourselves, it's not just destroying us and eating us up from the inside out, it's destroying our legacy, it's destroying our family. 41%, according to the Journal of Marriage and Family Therapy, 41% of both spouses admit to either physical or emotional fidelity without, within the, the duration of their marriage. That these affairs are taking about two years on average in length, and children of divorced parents are 50% more likely to get divorced themselves, and when two people come together, both from divorced homes, the divorce rate amongst that couple is 200% higher. I know there are different reasons that people get divorced, but I'm telling you, in the top three is infidelity. And so he says, take on the mind of Christ in your thoughts, in your purity. He says, focus on what's lovely, what's pleasurable, what's enjoyable. It's this idea of nature and the sunset or enjoying a, a walk. Have you ever guys have been on a beautiful walk in Aberdeen, South Dakota, and seen all the hills, <laughs> the mountainous terrain, right? Maybe you went by the softball complex. That's about as pretty as it gets in Aberdeen. Or you saw Moccasin Creek or whatever that was. But, you know, maybe you live on a farm. We live on a farmstead right now. And, and you go outside and you see the grass and, you know, you got, you got the fog coming up. He says, focus on what's lovely. That's what Paul's talking about here, fixing your focus on nature and what's beautiful, God's creation. He says, focus on what's commendable, what's worthy of, uh, of, 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 of following, reinforcing right behavior. He says, focus on what's excellent, what's worthy of praise. And there's this common bond between all of these concepts that discipline our mind. And the two common bonds are this. Number one, that they're all God-centered, that it's taking your eyes, and instead of focusing on the peripheral, it's looking up, And number two, in a world that is so incredibly negative, all of these concepts are positive. And fixing our focus on those things, starting the day with God, starting with God's words, starting with God's presence, starting with God's mindset, and letting that transform you by the renewing of your mind. Write it down if you haven't written it down yet. Discipline starts with the mind. And so here's what he says in the next verse. He says, whatever you have learned and received, verse nine, and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will will be with you. And so number two, the idea of this spiritual discipline is it starts in the mind, and then it quickly moves into your actions, into your behavior, and it's just like cognitive behavioral therapy. It goes from thinking to feeling to acting, and so he's saying there's this transference that takes place naturally in your life. When you put on the mind of Christ, you then practice these things, and then the byproduct of this is peace. I don't have any research to prove what I'm about to say, but I will just tell you this. There is a peace deficit in our world, amen? There is a peace deficit. Everyone is searching. I was telling one of our elders this morning, I can't prove this either, but I just know I'm right. If you took a survey in America where it stands right now, there would be more people who have counselors than pastors, I promise you. You go to the mental health center, you, you get on the list, it's just person after person after person after person after person that's searching 
They don't even know what they're searching for, but they know this, their mind is wreaking havoc on their life. And their focus is on this peripheral that's destructive. And their emotions are an absolute mess. And Paul is saying, discipline moves from thinking into acting, and then the byproduct is, when you think and then you act, that the peace of God will be with you. He says this, he says, take these things that I've just told you, simple concepts that are then now hard to apply in your life, and act on them. Practice these things, he says, because Christianity isn't just about information, and it was never designed to be just about information. Christianity, at its very core, is about transformation. No one usually says, you know, I want to know what that guy knows. People look at people around them, and they don't say, I want to know what that guy knows, or I want to know what that girl knows. They say this. They say, I want to live how that person lives because they're going through the same things in life that I'm going through, but their attitude and their mentality and their peace is so much different than mine. Their marriage and their family is so much different than mine. My highest goal is to seek pleasure in the temporary, and they seem to just have this eternal, this eternal perspective that brings peace in their life that I'm craving for, and I don't even quite understand it. He's saying it has to go from a place of thinking to a place of transformation to a place of acting. And the byproduct of that, write this down as well, is that when you live out this lifestyle, consistent obedience help, helps prevent these crisis cycles and this crisis that we're talking about. That these crises of life are not as random as you might think they are. And that they're a, usually a byproduct of garbage spiritually being placed in your mind over and over and over and over again, and then when crisis hits, you have nothing to combat that crisis because your mind is messed up. That your spiritual diet is just a bunch of garbage on social media. And when then the storm comes of life, it's either a byproduct of that garbage or it has something to do with something else, but you have no defense. You don't have the word of God to help you. You don't have a prayer life that you've committed to. You don't have the joy that you can walk in as you've disciplined your life in this way. Because all you've been doing is putting garbage in, and now garbage is coming out. Here's the last thing he says in verses 10 through 13. He says that when you discipline the mind, the byproduct of what it produces is this thing called contentment. That you get two things when you have a disciplined mind for the Lord that we all want. It's what everyone wants and very few people have. The byproduct is peace in your life and contentment regardless, regardless of your circumstance. I told you about this one other time like five years ago. I found it on my computer. And so I want to share it with you real quickly as we're starting to move towards closing this message out. There was a study in London, and it found that from age 13, and I think that's probably just connected to puberty. I raised teenagers, I will tell you, something about 13. It's like all of a sudden this kid that you thought was so great just goes crazy. Not my kid, your kids, but... But there's a study that was done in London. It was, it, was a, it was a longitudinal study, which is very expensive and very rare to be able to pull that off. And, and it had a, a, lot, a large sample size, which makes it more reliable. And from ages 13 to 40, they found that discontentment started at puberty, and it went on a downward spiral to the age of 40. And over all of the key developmental years, it just spiraled down and down and down, and then it peaked at 40. Thank God I'm 42. Last time I talked about this, I was still in the trenches. I finally have contentment in my life, all right? And then the highest age of contentment, I told you this guy's a long time ago, the highest age of contentment was 74. How many people are 74 or older in the first service this morning? Finally, you get there, right? 
All of us are struggling. All of us are surging. All of us have minds that are wreaking havoc in our life developmental stage where there's stress all around us and we're looking on the peripheral instead of fixing our eyes on the prize in Christ Jesus. And finally, at 74, it's 74 years old, you get some contentment in your life. And the problem with my family lineage is I would be the first Johnson male to arrive there in generations. So we're searching and we're searching and we're searching and Paul knows these truths. Paul knows what it's like to not have peace. I mean, let's just psychoanalyze him as we close. We know that he was a perfectionist. We know that he was a genius. We know that he was a workaholic, which also probably means that he was anxious and high strung and probably was hard to deal with, if you know anything about people. He was a Jew amongst the Jews. He was a, a top of his class. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. He came from good Jewish parents. He went to the right schools, graduated at the top of his class. This guy was a perfectionist, and this guy had issues. And what I guarantee you he didn't have before Christ is he didn't have peace, and he didn't have contentment. And now his life on the peripheral is an absolute mess, and he's saying, I have it figured out, not because of my circumstance, but despite my circumstance. And he gets saved from an anxious heart. He gets saved from perfectionism. He gets saved and realized that I thought I was so good, but really Christ is the only one worthy of my praise. And I'm going to focus on these things, and I'm going to have a disciplined mind, regardless of the fact that I'm sitting in a prison cell right now. He's in physical chains, but he's spiritually free. And he says this as we close. One of my favorite, favorite chapters of the Bible. Sitting in prison, verse 10, he says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received, revived your concern for me. He says, you were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation, underline this in your Bible if you have anxiety, I have learned in whatever situation I'm in to be content. I know how to be brought low, I know how to abound. And in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and facing hunger, of facing abundance and facing need. And then he says the famous verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is the discipline of the mind. That under that umbrella, I can do all things. Not because I'm great, but because Christ is great in me. And the bottom line is this, that your contentment, that your contentment is not contingent on your circumstance. How many of you actually believe that? That regardless of what's going on around you, you can be content. That you can have peace. How many of you actually believe that? Don't raise your hand if you don't believe it. Don't lie to me. Let, let me just prove to you empirically through, through, through one study, one case study of my own life, that this is absolutely true, that circumstance is not your problem, that circumstance is not my problem. I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to put it on a platter. If you disagree with me, the evidence is mounting. You're wrong, okay? Here's the evidence. Before I got married, any single people? Any single people? Before I got married, I thought when I got married and I found Miss, or now Mrs. Perfect, that I would be content. I was anxious about finding someone in Bible college because everyone around me was finding someone very early on. It was a ring by spring environment. All right? And then I got married and I was anxious in marriage. I was discontent in marriage. I was a, I was a beast my first five to seven years of marriage. If you want to know more about that, tough. It's not your story. It's my story, and, and Anne has to respect the fact that she can't tell all of our deep secrets about what a jerk I was the first five to seven years. When I got married, I was anxious in marriage. Before I had a career, I was anxious about not having a career. When I got a career, I decided I was going to be a pastor at New Life, and you guys can kind of fill in the blanks as to how that's gone, wreaking havoc on my mind throughout the years. I have found this beautiful way to be discontent in every life situation if I choose to. Regardless of my circumstance, I'm going to keep going. Before I had kids, I was anxious. My wife was anxious about not having kids. 
I remember the big argument, was it two or three? And then she won and we had three. And when I had kids, I was anxious because I had kids. And then I had teenagers and that's a whole nother level. I have never dealt with so much frustration in my own mind, things that are not even real, as I have raising teenagers. I can worry about stuff that doesn't exist for days. Before I had money, I was anxious about making money. When I got a little bit of money, and I mean a little bit, I was anxious because I didn't have enough of it. I can always look to life circumstances, the root of the problem, but the reality is I am the problem. Is that enough data for you? What's your case study look like? Is it different? Discipline of the mind produces contentment. And it's a process. Paul walks through a process where the mind is disciplined. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The last thing is this, that this contentment as a spiritual discipline, it's supernatural. It's supernatural. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can have peace because of Christ who strengthens me. I can fix my focus because of Christ who strengthens me. Here, here's what's so awesome about our focus. That it literally only takes the eyes to adjust. It's a subtle shift that has transformative power in your life. Your arms can stay still, your feet don't have to move, your head doesn't even have to rise, your neck can stay in place, and the only difference spiritually is that you are making this cognizant effort. Look at me when I do this. All you're doing is instead of looking straight out and around you to let life eat your lunch, you're just taking your eyes, look at my eyes, and you're just lifting them. You're just lifting your eyes and saying, give me the mind of Christ. I want your joy, I want your peace. I want your power, I want your will, I want your truth, and I want you to rule and reign in my life, and I believe as I take on this spiritual discipline of the mind, that this spiritual discipline of the mind is then gonna have a trickle-down effect like if it's researched through cognitive behavioral therapy, and it's gonna affect my thoughts, it's gonna affect my feelings, it's gonna affect my actions, and then that crisis cycle is gonna be averted because now I'm on this healthy trajectory where I'm serving Christ and round and round round and round it goes and the byproduct is peace and the byproduct is contentment and I am choosing to get off this crazy train. I am choosing to put on the mind of Christ because the definition of insanity is doing the same things and expecting different results. There's anxiety and depression. Praise band, come back up. There's anxiety, depression on mental health regarded issues. And then under that is way, way, way down on the, on the chart. And the primary reason we're anxious and the primary reason we're depressed is our focus. Look at me. Our focus is garbage. And we have a spiritual diet that is garbage. And Christ wants to take that and redeem that and put us on display for a world that needs Jesus to see. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. I, I thank you for new life. I thank you that we can have real and raw conversations about what change looks like. And Jesus, I just thank you that despite all of our shortcomings and failures, you, you save us from that and you're patient with us. You're long-suffering with us. You walk with us in the trenches as we seem to walk through these same crisis cycles of life. And you're telling us, you're telling your bride this morning that you can have victory in these areas of your mind, that you can have healing in these areas of your mind, and that you can love me and you can serve me. And it's a journey, and it's two step forward and one step back. But as you pursue me, your mind will change, and you will be a child of God that is saved, that's redeemed, that, that's transformed. Thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for the mind that you've given us in Christ. We pray these things in your precious and holy name. And everybody said, amen. Thanks so much for joining us today. 
We pray this message connected with you, and we hope it gave you another way to connect with Jesus and your New Life family. For more ways to get plugged in here at New Life, you can visit our website at www.newlifeaberdeen.org. Thanks again for listening and have a great week.